Chaotic systems are generally things we like to avoid, unless you work for a finance company or you're a mathematician. But are all chaotic systems as chaotic as they seem? And if not, why should we care? Well, today we're going to talk with Dr. Raz Sainuddin about trying to make some sense of all this chaos. Hi, hi Raz, how are you? I'm good. Uh, thanks for talking to us today. Um, I guess just the first thing I'd like to ask is, what is a chaotic system? Um, I think the simplest definition of a chaotic system um, is one where you sort of have something like a double pendulum and you sort of have something called sensitivity to initial conditions. So when I sort of release it from, say, this position and I observe it, it sort of goes around and it'll come to a rest because there's friction in the system. And after it's fully come to rest, we go back and release it again from the same position that we did. Like we will do now. Like well, we do now. more or less. More or less. It can be exactly the same. So that's the whole definition. So if I try and release it again, it's taking a different trajectory. Yes, did a couple of triple twirls there I didn't say last time. <laughs> so, I mean, so it's essentially the sensitivity, how sensitive the dynamics of the system are to differences in initial conditions. And um, so we sort of um, wanted to get actual data from the two arms of the double pendulum and we sort of built a little device in that uh, dub measurable double pendulum, you actually get uh, enclosures of the position of each arm using optical encoders. So we have data streaming out of the double pendulum, which we can plot and look at. And then when you look at those plots, you'll notice that although the pendulum was released from almost exactly the same position up to human neuromuscular control, it will start diverging quite fast. Um, the trajectories will start diverging. So that's basically a chaotic system. That's basically, why would we study these things? Why, why do you think it's important to study them? What can we learn? Um, so we can learn a lot about the dynamics of, of a particular system by, um, by studying it, by, um, by looking at um, how complicated things can get, although they sort of have an arbitrarily close um, initial condition and everything else is purely fixed, right? So even in a pure mathematical model where it's not um, anything really physical, even there, the slightest difference in initial conditions on you know, number systems we've sort of imagined as mathematicians and run the dynamical system, we'll still see the trajectories diverge, right? So it's sort of a way to really understand the system and how sensitive it is to initial conditions. And with this knowledge, we can better control a system, right? So when we try and launch a rocket into space, uh, you know, we, yep. we um, you know, the, there's boosters and they sort of fire and the rocket goes up, but there's wind and the thousand all of sorts variables of things. That's that right. you've got to work with, <laughs> That's don't right. you? Yeah. So you sort of have to um, adjust for it, and for that, you need to understand the dynamics of the, of, or, of the mathematical model of the system, yeah. so that when you have data coming in in terms of wind conditions and so on, you can adaptively control the rocket so that it you know, launches. It can be flexible yeah, exactly. and improvise somewhat with whatever conditions it gets. That's right. Yeah, That's yeah no, I can understand that quite a challenge. I mean, I can never get to work exactly on time, you know, no yeah. matter how I try. <laughs> There's always some <laughs> variable that'll get in the way, yeah. phone call, whatever. Okay, well, that's very interesting. So. Um, that's how that sort of chaotic system is applied. Is there any other area of research that you're particularly working on now? Yeah, so this is um, not really my area of expertise. There are other people in the department who are much better um, in this. I do mathematical and statistical genetics. Mm -hmm. And that essentially is the study of um, how living things are interrelated in space and time. So essentially, you know, if I run the movie backwards, you know, I become little and I yeah. was born in India and then yeah. I become a zygote in my mom's womb and my dad's sperm came in and, and I keep running the movie backwards. But then the yeah. question is, what am I tracing now? Because Raz is not there anymore, right? Yeah. So, well, we say, well, we can't trace Raz. <laughs> so we trace maybe a fragment of DNA somewhere in Raz and 
and cop and see how that goes because that fragment is actually tra traceable in back through time. And if we go that way, well, maybe say I look at maybe a mitochondrial fragment which I got from my mom, then you know that fragment would be in the mitochondria of my mom's egg, mm. and so that mitochondria would have come from my mom's mom's mitochondria egg, and so <laughs> on. So that's called the maternal lineage. Right. So if we did the same with yours yeah. and and the cameraman's, yes. right? <laughs> um, then what's going to happen is. There'll be three, we can just abstract. We're not related, by the way. So just oh, yeah. that's, that's what makes it exactly interesting. So we have to wait for a long time before we will, you know, if you sort of get into a magic school bus and jump into the mitochondria and yeah. go back through time, then all the mitochondrial lineages will, will meet somewhere way far, far away where we share the same great, 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 Some great sort grandmother. Of mitochondrial Adam and Eve or something. That's right. Like, well, yeah, it'll, yeah. it'll be much sooner uh, than that. Yeah. But yeah. 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 Um, so it's studying the structure of those graphs in space and time because in four dimensions, living things are completely interconnected. It's okay. one continuum. Wow. That's so. quite early in the morning to be blowing my mind <laughs> that much, Raz, but I'm, I'm going to take some deep breaths and move on with that. So, so. with all that information, so how, how do you apply that to... Yeah, so then once you sort of have mathematical models of how these objects are evolving in space-time, you can now do statistics with it. So that means you have some, um, some mathematical models that generate various data you might have in different fields. For instance, if you're into um, um, you know, crop or um, plant or animal breeding, then you have to try and understand how certain um, yields um, are related uh, um, to one another in a genetic sense. So you might have to understand um, you know, the genetics of the systems that you're breeding, right? So plant and animal breeding is a very standard application of mathematical and statistical genetics. The other one close to humans is uh, disease mapping, right? Okay. So if you want to find a particular disease-causing cohort of genes in a complex disease, then you need to understand, again, the implications of the underlying structures that relate a bunch of humans whose disease you're interested in. So because that hidden structure, which is how we are interconnected in the past, mm. really uh, has to be taken into account when we're hunting for diseases in humans. Yep. And the other one that's sort of more interesting, um, especially in New Zealand, is um, conservation genetics. So if we want to go and save a species that's about to go extinct, and we really are not able to, you know, um, um, do anything to keep it from going extinct, then we can take this sort of drastic measure where we say, okay, let's try and conserve the remaining genetic diversity in this species. Then we have to carefully set up, um, you know, possibly even breeding programs where we ensure that the, you know, amount of genetic diversity in this very small population of this threatened species doesn't decrease any further, right? Mm -hmm. So for that also you need to understand um, how these few individuals of that you know, threatened species are interrelated in space-time. So those are some basic examples. Basic example. And are there also um, situations where you have to decide on, with, with limited resources, which species you're going to put those resources into, or is that a different area? Yeah, area? so that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a difficult problem. It's a difficult problem. <laughs> you might just leave that one right there. The other thing I do understand, Raz, is that you're a bit of an, an experimental um, cooker, and you like to experiment with food, or, or is that just an oh, excuse yeah, yeah. to no. create chaos in the kitchen? <laughs> yeah, no, I grew up as an Indian, you know, so, but I grew up in the United States, so, and my wife is Indian American, so we make quite, you know, curry pizzas and. Okay, know, all um, right. Whatever, so that's what, yeah. I should probably take that out of my website. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I just the, make up whatever. You make up whatever. You look to the past and then you mess it all yeah. up and you come up with something. Yeah, new. yeah. Because, cool. I mean, whether something tastes good or not is really in your head anyway. Okay. Right. Well, that, that sounds like a whole other conversation. <laughs> but for right now, Raz, thanks very much for talking to us. It's yep. been a pleasure.